Section 14 of the Ingoldsby Legends, First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ingoldsby Legends, First Series by Richard Harris Barham. Section 14. Strange as the events detailed in the succeeding narrative may appear, they are, I have not the slightest doubt, true to the letter. Whatever impression they may make upon the reader, that produced by them on the narrator, I can aver, was neither light nor transient. Singular passage in the life of the late Henry Harris, Doctor in Divinity, as related by the Reverend Jasper Ingoldsby, M.A., his friend and executor. In order that the extraordinary circumstance which I am about to relate may meet with the credit it deserves, I think it necessary to premise that my reverend friend, among whose papers I find it recorded, was in his lifetime ever esteemed as a man of good plain understanding, strict veracity, and unimpeached morals, by no means of a nervous temperament, or one likely to attach undue weight to any occurrences out of the common course of events, merely because his reflections might not, at the moment, afford him a ready solution to its difficulties. On the truth of his narrative, as far as he was personally concerned, no one who knew him would hesitate to place the most implicit reliance. His history is briefly this. He had married early in life, and was a widower at the age of thirty-nine, with an only daughter, who had then arrived at puberty, and was just married to a near connection of our own family. The sudden death of her husband, occasioned by a fall from his horse, only three days after her confinement, was abruptly communicated to Mrs. S. by a thoughtless girl who saw her master brought lifeless into the house, and with all that inexplicable anxiety to be the first to tell bad news, so common among the lower orders, rushed at once into the sick-room with her intelligence. The shock was too severe, and though the young widow survived the fatal event several months, yet she gradually sank under the blow and expired, leaving a boy, not a twelve-month old, to the care of his maternal grandfather. My poor friend was sadly shaken by this melancholy catastrophe. Time, however, and a strong religious feeling, succeeded at length in moderating the poignancy of his grief, a consummation much advanced by his infant charge, who now succeeded, as it were, by inheritance, to the place in his affections left vacant by his daughter's decease. Frederick S. grew up to be a fine lad. His person and features were decidedly handsome. Still there was, as I remember, an unpleasant expression in his countenance, and an air of reserve attributed by the few persons who called occasionally at the vicarage, to the retired life led by his grandfather, and the little opportunity he had in consequence of mixing in the society of his equals in age and intellect. Brought up entirely at home, his progress in the common branches of education was, without any great display of precocity, rather in advance of the generality of boys of his own standing, partly owing, perhaps, to the turn which even his amusements took from the first. His sole associate was the son of the village apothecary, a boy about two years older than himself, whose father, being really clever in his profession, and a good operative chemist, had constructed for himself a small laboratory, in which, as he was fond of children, the two boys spent a great portion of their leisure time, witnessing many of those little experiments so attractive to youth, and in time aspiring to imitate what they admired. In such society it is not surprising that Frederick S. should imbibe a strong taste for the sciences which formed his principal amusement, or that when, in process of time, it became necessary to choose his walk in life, a profession so intimately connected with his favorite pursuit, as that of medicine, should be eagerly selected. No opposition was offered by my friend, who, knowing that the greater part of his own income would expire with his life, and that the remainder would prove an insufficient resource to his grandchild, was only anxious that he should follow such a path as would secure him that moderate and respectable competency 
which is perhaps more conducive to real happiness than a more elevated or wealthy station. Frederick was, accordingly, at the proper age, matriculated at Oxford, with the view of studying the higher branches of medicine. A few months after his friend John W. had proceeded to Leiden, for the purpose of making himself acquainted with the practice of surgery in the hospitals and lecture rooms attached to that university. The boyish intimacy of their younger days did not, as is frequently the case, yield to separation. On the contrary, a close correspondence was kept up between them. Dr. Harris was even prevailed upon to allow Frederick to take a trip to Holland to see his friend, and John returned the visit to Frederick at Oxford satisfactory as for some time were the accounts of the general course of frederick s's studies by degrees rumours of a less pleasant nature reached the ears of some of his friends to the vicarage however i have reason to believe they never penetrated the good old doctor was too well beloved in his parish for any one voluntarily to give him pain and after all nothing beyond whispers and surmises had reached x when the worthy vicar was surprised on a sudden by a request from his grandchild that he might be permitted to take his name off the books of the university and proceed to finish his education in conjunction with his friend w at leyden such a proposal made too at a time when the period for his graduating could not be far distant both surprised and grieved the doctor he combated the design with more perseverance than he had ever been known to exert in opposition to any declared wish of his darling boy before, but, as usual, gave way when more strongly pressed, from sheer inability to persist in a refusal which seemed to give so much pain to Frederick, especially when the latter, with more energy than was quite becoming their relative situations, expressed his positive determination of not returning to oxford whatever might be the result of his grandfather's decision my friend his mind perhaps a little weakened by a short but severe nervous attack from which he had scarcely recovered at length yielded a reluctant consent and frederick quitted england it was not till some months had elapsed after his departure that i had reason to suspect that the eager desire of availing himself of opportunities for study abroad not afforded him at home was not the sole or even the principal reason which had drawn frederick so abruptly from his alma mater a chance visit to the university and a conversation with a senior fellow belonging to his late college convinced me of this still i found it impossible to extract from the letter the precise nature of his offence that he had given way to most culpable indulgences i had before heard hinted and when i recollected how he had been at once launched from a state of what might be well called seclusion into a world where so many enticements were lying in wait to allure with liberty example everything to tempt him from the straight road regret i frankly own was more the predominant feeling in my mind than either surprise or condemnation. But here was evidently something more than mere ordinary excess, some act of profligacy, perhaps of a deeper stain, which had induced his superiors, who at first had been loud in his praises, to desire him to withdraw himself quietly, but for ever. And such an intimation, I found, had in fact been conveyed to him from an authority which it was impossible to resist seeing that my informant was determined not to be explicit i did not press for a disclosure which if made would in all probability only have given me pain and that the rather as my old friend the doctor had recently obtained a valuable living from lord m only a few miles distant from the market town in which i resided where he now was amusing himself in putting his grounds into order ornamenting his house and getting everything ready against his grandson's expected visit in the following autumn october came and with it came frederick he rode over more than once to see me sometimes accompanied by the doctor between whom and myself the recent loss of my poor daughter louisa had drawn the cords of sympathy still closer 
More than two years had flown on in this way, in which Frederick S. had as many times made temporary visits to his native country. The time was fast approaching when he was expected to return and finally take up his residence in England, when the sudden illness of my wife's father obliged us to take a journey into Lancashire, my old friend who had himself a curate, kindly offering to fix his quarters at my parsonage and superintend the concerns of my parish till my return. Alas, when I saw him next, he was on the bed of death. My absence was necessarily prolonged much beyond what I had anticipated. A letter with a foreign postmark had, as I afterwards found, been brought over from his own house to my venerable substitute in the interval, and barely giving himself time to transfer the charge he had undertaken to a neighboring clergyman, he had hurried off at once to Leiden. His arrival there was, however, too late. Frederick was dead killed in a duel, occasioned, it was said, by no ordinary provocation on his part, although the flight of his antagonist had added to the mystery which enveloped its origin. The long journey, its melancholy termination, and the complete overthrow of all my poor friend's earthly hopes, were too much for him. He appeared, too, as I was informed by the proprietor of the house in which I had found him, when his summons at length had brought me to his bedside, to have received some sudden and unaccountable shock, which even the death of his grandson was inadequate to explain. There was, indeed, a wildness in his fast glazing eye, which mingled strangely with the glance of satisfaction thrown upon me as he pressed my hand. He endeavoured to raise himself, and would have spoken, but fell back in the effort and closed his eyes for ever. I buried him there, by the side of the object of his more than parental affection, in a foreign land. It is from the papers that I discovered in his travelling case that I submit the following extracts, without, however, presuming to advance an opinion on the strange circumstances which they detail, or even as to the connection which some may fancy they discover between different parts of them. The first was evidently written at my own house, and bears date August the 15th, 18 blank, about three weeks after my own departure for Preston. It begins thus, Tuesday, August 15th. Poor girl! I forget who it is that says, the real ills of life are light in comparison with fancied evils and certainly the scene I have just witnessed goes some way towards establishing the truth of the hypothesis. Among the afflictions which flesh is heir to, a diseased imagination is far from being the lightest, even when considered separately, and without taking into the account those bodily pains and sufferings which, so close is the connection between mind and matter, are but too frequently attendant upon any disorder of the fancy. Seldom has my interest been more powerfully excited than by poor Mary Graham. Her age, her appearance, her pale, melancholy features, the very contour of her countenance, all conspire to remind me, but too forcibly, of one who, waking or sleeping, is never long absent from my thoughts. But enough of this. A fine morning had succeeded one of the most tempestuous nights I ever remember and I was just sitting down to a substantial breakfast, which the care of my friend Inglesby's housekeeper, kind-hearted Mrs. Wilson, had prepared for me, when I was interrupted by a summons to the sick-bed of a young parishioner whom I had frequently seen in my walks, and had remarked for the regularity of her attendance at divine worship. Mary Graham is the elder of two daughters, residing with their mother, the widow of an attorney, who dying suddenly in the prime of life, left his family but slenderly provided for. A strict though not parsimonious economy has, however, enabled them to live with an appearance of respectability and comfort, and from the personal attractions which both the girls possess, their mother is evidently not without hopes of seeing one, at least, of them advantageously settled in life. As far as poor Mary is concerned, 
I fear she is doomed to inevitable disappointment, as I am much mistaken if consumption has not laid its wasting finger upon her, while this last recurrence of what I cannot but believe to be a formidable epileptic attack threatens to shake out, with even added velocity, the little sand that may yet remain within the hourglass of time. Her very delusion, too, is of such a nature as, by adding to bodily illness the agitation of superstitious terror, can scarcely fail to accelerate the catastrophe, which I think I see fast approaching. Before I was introduced into the sick room, her sister, who had been watching my arrival from the window, took me into their little parlour, and after the usual civilities, began to prepare me for the visit I was about to pay. Her countenance was marked at once with trouble and alarm, and in a low tone of voice, which some internal emotion, rather than the fear of disturbing the invalid in a distant room, had subdued almost to a whisper, informed me that my presence was become necessary, not more as a clergyman than a magistrate, that the disorder with which her sister had, during the night, been so suddenly and unaccountably seized, was one of no common kind, but attended with circumstances which, coupled with the declarations of the sufferer, took it out of all ordinary calculations, and to use her own expression, that malice was at the bottom of it. Naturally supposing that these insinuations were intended to intimate the partaking of some deleterious substance on the part of the invalid, I inquired what reason she had for imagining, in the first place, that anything of a poisonous nature had been administered at all, and secondly, what possible incitement any human being could have for the perpetration of so foul a deed towards so innocent and unoffending an individual. Her answer considerably relieved the apprehensions I had begun to entertain, lest the poor girl should, from some unknown cause, have herself been attempting to rush uncalled into the presence of her creator. At the same time, it surprised me not a little by its apparent want of rationality and common sense. She had no reason to believe, she said, that her sister had taken poison, or that any attempt upon her life had been made, or was perhaps contemplated, but that still malice was at work, the malice of villains or fiends, or of both combined, that no causes purely natural would suffice to account for the state in which her sister had been now twice placed, or for the dreadful sufferings she had undergone while in that state, and that she was determined the whole affair should undergo a thorough investigation. Seeing that the poor girl was now herself laboring under a great degree of excitement, I did not think it necessary to enter at that moment into a discussion upon the absurdity of her opinion, but applied myself to the tranquilizing of her mind by assurances of a proper inquiry, and then drew her attention to the symptoms of the indisposition, and the way in which it had first made its appearance. The violence of the storm last night had, I found, induced the whole family to sit up far beyond their usual hour, till wearied out at length, and as their mother observed, tired of burning fire and candle to no purpose, they repaired to their several chambers. The sisters occupied the same room. Elizabeth was already at her humble toilet, and had commenced the arrangement of her hair for the night, when her attention was at once drawn from her employment by a half-smothered shriek and exclamation from her sister, who, in her delicate state of health, had found walking up two flights of stairs, perhaps a little more quickly than usual, an exertion to recover from which she had seated herself in a large armchair. Turning hastily at the sound, she perceived Mary deadly pale, grasping, as it were convulsively, each arm of the chair which supported her, and bending forward in the attitude of listening. Her lips were trembling and bloodless. Cold drops of perspiration stood upon her forehead, and in an instant after exclaiming in a piercing tone, Hark! they are calling me again. It is, it is the same voice. 
Oh, no, no. Oh, my God. Save me, Betsy. Hold me. Save me. She fell forward upon the floor. Elizabeth flew to her assistance, raised her, and by her cries brought both her mother, who had not yet gotten to bed, and their only servant girl, to her aid. The latter was dispatched at once for medical help, but from the appearance of the sufferer, it was much to be feared that she would soon be beyond the reach of art. Her agonized parent and sister succeeded in bearing her between them and placing her on a bed. A faint and intermittent pulsation was for a while perceptible, but in a few moments a general shudder shook the whole body. The pulse ceased. The eyes became fixed and glassy. The jaw dropped. A cold clamminess usurped the place of the genial warmth of life. Before Mr. I arrived, everything announced that dissolution had taken place, and that the freed spirit had quitted its mortal tenement. The appearance of the surgeon confirmed their worst apprehensions. A vein was opened, but the blood refused to flow, and Mr. I pronounced that the vital spark was indeed extinguished. The poor mother, whose attachment to her children was perhaps the more powerful, as they were the sole relatives or connections she had in the world, was overwhelmed with a grief amounting almost to frenzy. It was with difficulty that she was removed to her own room by the united strength of her daughter and medical adviser. Nearly an hour had elapsed during the endeavour at calming her transports. They had succeeded, however, to a certain extent, and Mr. I had taken his leave, when Elizabeth, re-entering the bedchamber in which her sister lay, in order to pay the last sad duties to her corpse, was horror-struck at seeing a crimson stream of blood running down the side of the counterpane to the floor. Her exclamation brought the girl again to her side, when it was perceived, to their astonishment, that the sanguine stream proceeded from the arm of the body, which was now manifesting signs of returning life. The half-frantic mother flew to the room, and it was with difficulty that they could prevent her, in her agitation, from so acting as to extinguish forever the hope which had begun to rise in their bosoms. A long-drawn sigh, amounting almost to a groan, followed by several convulsive gaspings, was the prelude to the restoration of the animal functions in poor Mary. A shriek, almost preternaturally loud, considering her state of exhaustion, succeeded. But she did recover, and with the help of restoratives, was well enough towards morning to express a strong desire that I should be sent for, a desire the more readily complied with, inasmuch as the strange expressions and declarations she had made since her restoration to consciousness had filled her sister with the most horrible suspicions. The nature of these suspicions was such as would at any other time, perhaps, have raised a smile upon my lips, but the distress and even agony of the poor girl, as she half hinted and half expressed them, were such as entirely to preclude every sensation at all approaching to mirth. Without endeavouring, therefore, to combat ideas evidently too strongly impressed upon her mind at the moment, to admit of present refutation, I merely used a few encouraging words, and requested her to precede me to the sick chamber. The invalid was lying on the outside of the bed, partly dressed, and wearing a white dimity wrapping-gown, the colour of which corresponded but too well with the deadly paleness of her complexion. Her cheek was wan and sunken, giving an extraordinary prominence to her eye, which gleamed with a lustrous brilliancy not unfrequently characteristic of the aberration of intellect. I took her hand. It was chill and clammy, the pulse feeble and intermittent, and the general debility of her frame was such that I would fain have persuaded her to defer any conversation which, in her present state, she might not be equal to support. Her positive assurance that, until she had disburdened herself of what she called her 
dreadful secret. She could know no rest either of mind or body, at length induced me to comply with her wish, opposition to which, in her then frame of mind, might perhaps be attended with even worse effects than its indulgence. I bowed acquiescence, and in a low and faltering voice, with frequent interruptions occasioned by her weakness, she gave me the following singular account of the sensations which, she averred, had been experienced by her during her trance. This, sir, she began, is not the first time that the cruelty of others has, for what purpose I am unable to conjecture, put me to a degree of torture which I can compare to no suffering either of body or mind, which I have ever before experienced. On a former occasion I was willing to believe it the mere effect of a hideous dream, or what is vulgarly termed the nightmare, but this repetition, and the circumstances under which I was last summoned, at a time, too, when I had not even composed myself to rest, fatally convince me of the reality of what I have seen and suffered. This is no time for concealment of any kind. It is now more than a twelve-month since I was in the habit of occasionally encountering, in my walks, a young man of prepossessing appearance and gentlemanly deportment. He was always alone, and generally reading, but I could not be long in doubt that these rencounters, which became every week more frequent, were not the effect of accident, or that his attention when we did meet was less directed to his book than to my sister and myself. He even seemed to wish to address us, and I have no doubt would have taken some other opportunity of doing so, had not one been afforded him by a strange dog attacking us one Sunday morning in our way to church, which he beat off, and made use of this little service to promote an acquaintance. His name, he said, was Francis Summers, and added that he was on a visit to a relation of the same name, resident a few miles from X. He gave us to understand that he was himself studying surgery with the view to a medical appointment in one of the colonies. You are not to suppose, sir, that he had entered thus into his concerns at the first interview. It was not till our acquaintance had ripened, and he had visited our house more than once with my mother's sanction, that these particulars were elicited. He never disguised from the first that an attachment to myself was his object originally in introducing himself to our notice. As his prospects were comparatively flattering, my mother did not raise any impediment to his attentions, and I own I received them with pleasure. Days and weeks elapsed, and although the distance at which his relation resided prevented the possibility of an uninterrupted intercourse, yet neither was it so great as to preclude his frequent visits. The interval of a day, or at most of two, was all that intervened, and these temporary absences certainly did not decrease the pleasure of the meetings with which they terminated. At length a pensive expression began to exhibit itself upon his countenance, and I could not but remark that at every visit he became more abstracted and reserved. The eye of affection is not slow to detect any symptom of uneasiness in a quarter dear to it. I spoke to him, questioned him on the subject. His answer was evasive, and I said no more. My mother, too, however, had marked the same appearance of melancholy, and pressed him more strongly. He at length admitted that his spirits were depressed, and that their depression was caused by the necessity of an early, though but a temporary separation. His uncle and only friend, he said, had long insisted on his spending some months on the continent, with the view of completing his professional education, and that the time was now fast approaching when it would be necessary for him to commence his journey. A look made the inquiry which my tongue refused to utter. Yes, dearest Mary, was his reply. I have communicated our attachment to him, partially at least, and though I dare not say that the intimation 
was received as I could have wished. Yet I have, perhaps, on the whole, no fair reason to be dissatisfied with his reply. The completion of my studies, and my settlement in the world, must, my uncle told me, be the first consideration. When these material points were achieved, he should not interfere with any arrangement that might be found essential to my happiness. At the same time he has positively refused to sanction any engagement at present which may, he says, have a tendency to divert my attention from those pursuits on the due prosecution of which my future situation in life must depend. A compromise between love and duty was eventually wrung from me, though reluctantly. I have pledged myself to proceed immediately to my destination abroad, with a full understanding that, on my return, a twelve-month hence, no obstacle shall be thrown in the way of what are, I trust, our mutual wishes. I will not attempt to describe the feelings with which I received this communication, nor will it be necessary to say anything of what passed at the few interviews which took place before Francis quitted X. The evening immediately previous to that of his departure he passed in this house, and before we separated renewed his protestations of an unchangeable affection, requiring a similar assurance from me in return. I did not hesitate to make it. Be satisfied, my dear Francis, said I, that no diminution in the regard I have avowed can ever take place, and though absent in body, my heart and soul will still be with you. Swear this, he cried, with a suddenness and energy which surprised and rather startled me. Promise that you will be with me, in spirit at least, when I am far away. I gave him my hand, but that was not sufficient. One of these dark shining ringlets, my dear Mary, said he, as a pledge that you will not forget your vow. I suffered him to take the scissors from my work-box and to sever a lock of my hair, which he placed in his bosom. The next day he was pursuing his journey, and the waves were already bearing him from England. I had letters from him repeatedly during the first three months of his absence. They spoke of his health, his prospects, and of his love. But by degrees the intervals between each arrival became longer, and I fancied I perceived some falling off from that warmth of expression which had at first characterized his communications. One night I had retired to rest rather later than usual, having sat by the bedside, comparing his last brief note with some of his earlier letters, and was endeavouring to convince myself that my apprehensions of his fickleness were unfounded, when an undefinable sensation of restlessness and anxiety seized upon me. I cannot compare it to anything I had ever experienced before. My pulse fluttered, my heart beat with a quickness and violence which alarmed me, and a strange tremor shook my whole frame. I retired hastily to bed, in hopes of getting rid of so unpleasant a sensation, but in vain. A vague apprehension of I knew not what occupied my mind, and vainly did I endeavour to shake it off. I can compare my feelings to nothing but those which we sometimes experience when about to undertake a long and unpleasant journey, leaving those we love behind us. More than once did I raise myself in my bed and listen fancying that I heard myself called, and on each of those occasions the fluttering of my heart increased. Twice I was on the point of calling to my sister, who then slept in an adjoining room, but she had gone to bed indisposed, and an unwillingness to disturb either her or my mother checked me. The large clock in the room below at this moment began to strike the hour of twelve, I distinctly heard its vibrations, but ere its sounds had ceased, a burning heat, as if a hot iron had been applied to my temple, was succeeded by a dizziness, a swoon, a total loss of consciousness as to where or in what situation I was. A pain, violent, sharp, and piercing, 
as though my whole frame were lacerated by some keen-edged weapon, roused me from this stupor. But where was I? Everything was strange around me. A shadowy dimness rendered every object indistinct and uncertain. Methought, however, that I was seated in a large, antique, high-backed chair, several of which were near, their tall black carved frames and seats interwoven with a lattice-work of cane. The apartment in which I sat was one of moderate dimensions, and from its sloping roof seemed to be the upper story of the edifice, a fact confirmed by the moon shining without, in full effulgence on a huge round tower, which its light rendered plainly visible through the open casement, and the summit of which appeared but little superior in elevation to the room I occupied. Rather to the right and in the distance the spire of some cathedral or lofty church was visible, while sundry gable-ends and tops of houses told me I was in the midst of a populous but unknown city. End of section 14《Inglesby Legends》First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Inglesby Legends》First Series by Richard Harris Barham. Section 15. The apartment itself had something strange in its appearance, and in the character of its furniture and appurtenances bore little or no resemblance to any I had ever seen before. The fireplace was large and wide, with a pair of what are sometimes called andirons betokening that wood was the principal if not the only fuel consumed within its recess. A fierce fire was now blazing in it, the light from which rendered visible the remotest parts of the chamber. Over a lofty old-fashioned mantelpiece, carved heavily in imitation of fruits and flowers, hung the half-length portrait of a gentleman in a dark-coloured foreign habit, with a peaked beard and moustaches, one hand resting upon a table the other supporting a sort of baton, or short military staff, the summit of which was surmounted by a silver falcon. Several antique chairs, similar in appearance to those already mentioned, surrounded a massive oaken table, the length of which much exceeded its width. At the lower end of this piece of furniture stood the chair I occupied. On the upper was placed a small chafing dish filled with burning coals, and darting forth occasionally long flashes of various coloured fire, the brilliance of which made itself visible, even above the strong illumination emitted from the chimney. Two huge black japanned cabinets with clawed feet, reflecting from their polished surfaces the effulgence of the flame, were placed one on each side the casement window to which I have alluded, and with a few shelves loaded with books, many of which were also strewed in disorder on the floor, completed the list of the furniture in the apartment. Some strange-looking instruments of unknown form and purpose lay on the table near the chafing dish, on the other side of which a miniature portrait of myself hung, reflected by a small oval mirror in a dark-coloured frame, while a large open volume, traced with strange characters of the colour of blood, lay in front, a goblet containing a few drops of liquid of the same ensanguined hue was by its side, but of the objects which I have endeavoured to describe, none arrested my attention so forcibly as two others. These were the figures of two young men in the prime of life, only separated from me by the table. They were dressed alike, each in a long flowing gown made of some sad-coloured stuff, and confined at the waist by a crimson girdle. One of them, the shorter of the two, was occupied in feeding the embers of the chafing dish with a resinous powder, which produced and maintained a brilliant but flickering blaze, to the action of which his companion was exposing a long lock of dark chestnut hair that shrank and shriveled as it approached the flame. But, oh God, that hair, and the form of him who held it, that face, those features, not for one instant could I entertain a doubt. It was he, Francis. The lock he grasped was mine. 
the very pledge of affection I had given him. And still, as it partially encountered the fire, a burning heat seemed to scorch the temple from which it had been taken, conveying a torturing sensation that affected my very brain. How shall I proceed? But no, it is impossible. Not even to you, sir, can I, dare I, recount the proceedings of that unhallowed night of horror and of shame. Were my life extended to a term commensurate with that of the patriarchs of old, never could its detestable, its damning pollutions be effaced from my remembrance. And, oh, above all, never could I forget the diabolical glee which sparkled in the eyes of my fiendish tormentors as they witnessed the worse than useless struggles of their miserable victim. Oh, why was it not permitted me to take refuge in unconsciousness, nay, in death itself, from the abominations of which I was compelled to be not only a witness, but a partaker? But it is enough, sir. I will not further shock your nature by dwelling longer on a scene, the full horrors of which, words, if I even dared employ any, would be inadequate to express. Suffice it to say, that after being subjected to it, how long I knew not, but certainly for more than an hour, a noise from below seemed to alarm my persecutors. A pause ensued, the lights were extinguished, and, as the sound of a footstep ascending a staircase became more distinct, my forehead felt again the excruciating sensation of heat, while the embers kindling into a momentary flame betrayed another portion of the ringlet consuming in the blaze. Fresh agonies succeeded, not less severe, and of a similar description to those which had seized upon me at first. Oblivion again followed, and on being at length restored to consciousness, I found myself as you see me now, faint and exhausted, weakened in every limb, and every fibre quivering with agitation. My groans soon brought my sister to my aid. It was long before I could summon resolution to confide even to her the dreadful secret, and when I had done so, her strongest efforts were not wanting, to persuade me that I had been labouring under a severe attack of nightmare. I ceased to argue, but I was not convinced. The whole scene was then too present, too awfully real, to permit me to doubt the character of the transaction, and if, when a few days had elapsed, the hopelessness of imparting to others the conviction I entertained myself, produced in me an apparent acquiescence with their opinion, I have never been the less satisfied that no cause reducible to the known laws of nature occasioned my sufferings on that hellish evening. Whether that firm belief might have eventually yielded to time, whether I might at length have been brought to consider all that had passed, and the circumstances which I could never cease to remember, as a mere phantasm, the offspring of a heated imagination, acting upon an enfeebled body, I know not. Last night, however, would in any case have dispelled the flattering illusion. Last night, last night was the whole horrible scene acted over again. The place, the actors, the whole infernal apparatus were the same. The same insults, the same torments, the same brutalities, all were renewed, save that the period of my agony was not so prolonged. I became sensible to an incision in my arm, though the hand that made it was not visible. At the same moment my persecutors paused. They were manifestly disconcerted, and the companion of him whose name shall never more pass my lips muttered something to his abettor in evident agitation. The formula of an oath of horrible import was dictated to me in terms fearfully distinct. I refused it unhesitatingly. Again and again was it proposed, with menaces I trembled to think on, but I refused. The same sound was heard. Interruption was evidently apprehended. The same ceremony was hastily repeated, and I again found myself released, lying on my own bed, with my mother and my sister weeping over me. 
Oh, God, oh, God, when and how is this to end? When will my spirit be left in peace? Where or with whom shall I find refuge? It is impossible to convey any adequate idea of the emotions with which this unhappy girl's narrative affected me. It must not be supposed that her story was delivered in the same continuous and uninterrupted strain in which I have transcribed its substance. On the contrary, it was not without frequent intervals, of longer or shorter duration, that her account was brought to a conclusion. Indeed, many passages of her strange dream were not without the greatest difficulty and reluctance communicated at all. My task was no easy one. Never in the course of a long life spent in the active duties of my Christian calling, never had I been summoned to such a conference before. To the half-avowed and palliated confession of committed guilt I had often listened, and pointed out the only road to secure its forgiveness. I had succeeded in cheering the spirit of despondency, and sometimes even in calming the ravings of despair. But here I had a different enemy to combat, an ineradicable prejudice to encounter, evidently backed by no common share of superstition, and confirmed by the mental weakness attendant upon severe bodily pain. To argue the sufferer out of an opinion, so rooted, was a hopeless attempt. I did, however, essay it. I spoke to her of the strong and mysterious connection maintained between our waking images and those which haunt us in our dreams, and more especially during that morbid oppression commonly called nightmare. I was even enabled to adduce myself as a strong and living instance of the excess to which fancy sometimes carries her freaks on those occasions while by an odd coincidence the impression made upon my own mind which i adduced as an example bore no slight resemblance to her own i stated to her that on my recovery from the fit of epilepsy which had attacked me about two years since just before my grandson frederick left oxford it was with the greatest difficulty i could persuade myself that i had not visited him during the interval in his rooms at Brasenose, and even conversed with himself and his friend W., seated in his armchair, and gazing through the window full upon the statue of Cain, as it stands in the centre of the quadrangle. I told her of the pain I underwent both at the commencement and termination of my attack, of the extreme lassitude that succeeded, but my efforts were all in vain. She listened to me, indeed, with an interest almost breathless, especially when I informed her of my having actually experienced the very burning sensation in the brain alluded to, no doubt a strong attendant symptom of this peculiar affection, and a proof of the identity of the complaint, but I could plainly perceive that I failed entirely in shaking the rooted opinion which possessed her, that her spirit had by some nefarious and unhallowed means, been actually subtracted for a time from its earthly tenement. The next extract which I shall give from my old friend's memoranda is dated August 24th, more than a week subsequent to his first visit at Mrs. Graham's. He appears from his papers to have visited the poor young woman more than once during the interval and to have afforded her those spiritual consolations which no one was more capable of communicating his patient for so in a religious sense she may well be termed had been sinking under the agitation she had experienced and the constant dread she was under of similar sufferings operated so strongly on a frame already enervated that life at length seemed to hang only by a thread his papers go on to say, I have just seen poor Mary Graham. I fear for the last time. Nature is evidently quite worn out. She is aware that she is dying, and looks forward to the termination of her existence here, not only with resignation, but with joy. It is clear that her dream, or what she persists in calling her subtraction, has much to do with this. For the last three days her behavior has been altered. 
she has avoided conversing on the subject of her delusion and seems to wish that i should consider her as a convert to my view of her case this may perhaps be partly owing to the flippancies of her medical attendant upon the subject for mr i has somehow or other got an inkling that she has been much agitated by a dream and thinks to laugh off the impression in my opinion injudiciously but though a skilful and a kind-hearted he is a young man and of a disposition perhaps rather too mercurial for the chamber of a nervous invalid her manner has since been much more reserved to both of us in my case probably because she suspects me of betraying her secret august twenty sixth mary graham is yet alive but sinking fast her cordiality towards me has returned since her sister confessed yesterday that she had herself told mr i that his patient's mind had been affected by a terrible vision i am evidently restored to her confidence she asked me this morning with much earnestness what i believed to be the state of departed spirits during the interval between dissolution and the final day of account and whether i thought they would be safe in another world from the influence of wicked persons employing an agency more than human poor child one cannot mistake the prevailing bias of her mind poor child august twenty seventh it is nearly over she is sinking rapidly but quietly and without pain i have just administered to her the sacred elements of which her mother partook elizabeth declined doing the same she cannot she says yet bring herself to forgive the villain who has destroyed her sister it is singular that she a young woman of good plain sense in ordinary matters should so easily adopt and so pertinaciously retain a superstition so puerile and ridiculous this must be matter of a future conversation between us at present with the form of the dying girl before her eyes it were vain to argue with her the mother i find has written to young summers stating the dangerous situation of his affianced wife indignant as she justly is at his long silence it is fortunate that she has no knowledge of the suspicions entertained by her daughter i have seen her letter it is addressed to mr francis summers in the hogewart at leyden a fellow student then of frederick's i must remember to inquire if he is acquainted with this young man mary graham it appears died the same night before her departure she repeated to my friend the singular story she had before told him without any material variation from the detail she had formerly given to the last she persisted in believing that her unworthy lover had practised upon her by forbidden arts she once more described the apartment with great minuteness and even the person of francis alleged companion who was she said about the middle height hard featured with a rather remarkable scar upon his left cheek extending in a transverse direction from below the eye to the nose several pages of my reverend friend's manuscript are filled with reflections upon this extraordinary confession which joined with its melancholy termination seems to have produced no common effect upon him he alludes to more than one subsequent discussion with the surviving sister and piques himself on having made some progress in convincing her of the folly of her theory respecting the origin and nature of the illness itself his memoranda on this and other subjects are continued till about the middle of september when a break ensues occasioned no doubt by the unwelcome news of his grandson's dangerous state which induced him to set out forthwith for holland his arrival at leyden was as i have already said too late frederick s had expired after thirty hours intense suffering from a wound received in a duel with a brother student the cause of quarrel was variously related but according to his landlord's version it had originated in some silly dispute about a dream of his antagonists who had been the challenger 
such at least was the account given to him as he said by frederick's friend and fellow lodger w who had acted as second on the occasion thus acquitting himself of an obligation of the same kind due to the deceased whose services he had put in requisition about a year before on a similar occasion when he had himself been severely wounded in the face from the same authority i learned that my poor friend was much affected on finding that his arrival had been deferred too long every attention was shown him by the proprietor of the house a respectable tradesman and a chamber was prepared for his accommodation the books and few effects of his deceased grandson were delivered over to him duly inventoried and late as it was in the evening when he reached leyden he insisted on being conducted immediately to the apartments which frederick had occupied there to indulge the first ebullitions of his sorrows before he retired to his own madame miller accordingly led the way to an upper room which being situated at the top of the house had been from its privacy and distance from the street selected by frederick as his study the doctor entered and taking the lamp from his conductress motioned to be left alone his implied wish was of course complied with and nearly two hours had elapsed before his kind-hearted hostess reascended in the hope of prevailing upon him to return with her and partake of that refreshment which he had in the first instance peremptorily declined her application for admission was unnoticed she repeated it more than once without success then becoming somewhat alarmed at the continued silence opened the door and perceived her new inmate stretched on the floor in a fainting fit restoratives were instantly administered and prompt medical aid succeeded at length in restoring him to consciousness but his mind had received a shock from which during the few weeks he survived it never entirely recovered his thoughts wandered perpetually and though from the very slight acquaintance which his hosts had with the english language the greater part of what fell from him remained unknown yet enough was understood to induce them to believe that something more than the mere death of his grandson had contributed thus to paralyze his faculties when his situation was first discovered a small miniature was found tightly grasped in his right hand it had been the property of frederick and had more than once been seen by the millers in his possession to this the patient made continued reference and would not suffer it one moment from his sight it was in his hand when he expired at my request it was produced to me the portrait was that of a young woman in an english morning dress whose pleasing and regular features with their mild and somewhat pensive expression were not i thought altogether unknown to me her age was apparently about twenty a profusion of dark chestnut hair was arranged in the madonna style above a brow of unsullied whiteness a single ringlet depending on the left side a glossy lock of the same colour and evidently belonging to the original appeared beneath a small crystal inlaid in the back of the picture which was plainly set in gold and bore in a cipher the letters m g with the date eighteen blank from the inspection of this portrait i could at the time collect nothing nor from that of the doctor himself which also i found the next morning in frederick's desk accompanied by two separate portions of hair one of them was a lock short and deeply tinged with grey and had been taken i have little doubt from the head of my old friend himself the other corresponded in colour and appearance with that at the back of the miniature it was not till a few days had elapsed and i had seen the worthy doctor's remains quietly consigned to the narrow house that while arranging his papers previous to my intended return upon the morrow i encountered the narrative i have already transcribed the name of the unfortunate young woman connected with it forcibly arrested my attention i recollected it immediately as one belonging to a parishioner of my own and at once recognized the original 
of the female portrait as its owner. I rose not from the perusal of his very singular statement till I had gone through the whole of it. It was late, and the rays of the single lamp by which I was reading did but very faintly illumine the remoter parts of the room in which I sat. The brilliancy of an unclouded November moon, then some twelve nights old, and shining full into the apartment, did much towards remedying the defect. My thoughts filled with the melancholy details I had read, I rose and walked to the window. The beautiful planet rose high in the firmament, and gave to the snowy roofs of the houses and pendant icicles all the sparkling radiance of clustering gems. The stillness of the scene harmonized well with the state of my feelings. I threw open the casement and looked abroad. Far below me, the water of the principal canal shone like a broad mirror in the moonlight. To the left rose the Burked, a huge round tower of remarkable appearance, pierced with embrasures at its summit, while a little to the right and in the distance the spire and pinnacles of the cathedral of Leiden rose in all their majesty, presenting a coup d'oeil of surpassing though simple beauty. To a spectator of calm, unoccupied mind, the scene would have been delightful. On me it acted with an electric effect. I turned hastily to survey the apartment in which I had been sitting. It was the one designated as the study of the late Frederick S. The sides of the room were covered with dark wainscot. The spacious fireplace opposite to me, with its polished andirons, was surmounted by a large old-fashioned mantelpiece, heavily carved in the Dutch style with fruits and flowers. Above it frowned a portrait in a Van Dyke dress, with a peaked beard and moustaches. One hand of the figure rested on a table, while the other bore a marshal's staff, surmounted with a silver falcon, and either my imagination, already heated by the scene, deceived me, or a smile, as of malicious triumph, curled the lip, and glared in the cold leaden eye that seemed fixed upon my own. The heavy antique cane-backed chairs, the large oaken table, the bookshelves, the scattered volumes, all, all were there, while to complete the picture, to my right and left, as half breathless I leaned my back against the casement, rose on each side a tall, dark, ebony cabinet, in whose polished sides the single lamp upon the table shone reflected as in a mirror. What am I to think? Can it be that the story I have been reading was written by my poor friend here, and under the influence of delirium? Impossible. Besides, they all assure me that from the fatal night of his arrival, he never left his bed, never put pen to paper. His very directions to have me summoned from England were verbally given, during one of those few and brief intervals in which reason seemed partially to resume her sway. Can it then be possible that W. Where is he who alone may be able to throw light on this horrible mystery? No one knows. He absconded, it seems, immediately after the duel. No trace of him exists, nor, after repeated and anxious inquiries, can I find that any student has ever been known in the University of Leiden by the name of Francis Summers. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. End of section 15